Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ZJLF at the British Library uh, Knowledge Centre Theatre. Uh, we are delighted to introduce JP Losty and Melina Roy. Um, please ensure that your phones are on silent and no flash photography, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Melanie Roy. I'm a curator here at the British Library and my uh, curator of visual arts. But it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jerry Losty, an art historian specializing in the art of South Asia. During his early career, Jerry was the assistant keeper in the Department of Oriental Manuscripts and Printed Books at the British Museum's Library, and later head of prints, drawings, and photographs at the India Office Library, which was sub subsequently turned into the British Library. During his career, he curated several blockbuster exhibitions, including Art of the Book in India, in 1982, Calcutta, City of Palaces in 1990, the Ramayana, Love and Valor in India's Great Epic in 2008. Jerry has co-authored or authored more than 20 books on Indian painting from the 12th to the 19th centuries. In the last five years, he's authored Mughal India, Art, Culture and Empire, Delhi 360, Company Paintings from the Jagdish Mittal Collection, and of course, his book on Sita Ram. As former curator at the British Library, Jerry diligently worked to shape the library's collection of Indian visual materials by actively acquiring important works of art. In 1995, through Jerry's guidance, the library, with the assistance of the National Art Collections Fund, acquired the collection of albums formed by the Marquess of Hastings in India between 1813 to 23, which showcases the work of the artist Sita Ram. This afternoon, we have the pleasure of hearing Jerry talk about Sita Ram's picturesque views, documenting the Hastings life and travels in India. I hope you'll welcome me in, in joining Jerry and his talk on Sita Ram. Thank you, Marani. <clears throat> well, Melanie has already mentioned that I'm going to talk about a collection of albums that was, were acquired by the British Library in 1995. There were 25 albums in all, and they were form, formed by Lord Hastings the East India Company's Governor General of Bengal from 1813 to 1822. 25 albums by Indian, Chinese and British artists. They've been for the last 150 years in the collections of the Marquis of Butte at, his, at the Scottish house uh, Mount Stuart on the island of Butte. And, they have, and they're obviously the Buttes knew about them. They were totally unpublished and otherwise unknown. The collection contained eight albums of drawings by an artist called Sita Ram, which illustrating Lord, Hasty, Lord and Lady Hastings' journey from Calcutta up to Delhi and beyond, and back again in 1814-1815. This journey has been long known about through the publication in 1858 of the Journal of the Marquis of Hastings which was edited by his daughter, the Marchioness of Butte. Was, that's how these um, albums that went from the Hastings collections to the Butte's collections. And the Marchioness, uh, Sir Sophia Hastings, as a child, actually accompanied the, her, her parents on this big voyage. Now, these new albums, these eight albums, supplemented another two, which had been known about since 1974 since these were sent to auction in that year and the subsequently dispersed, so that the, the drawings from those two albums are uh, scattered in various collections in India and the St in sorry in Europe and the States. So this, these ten albums, each with twenty three drawings, form a grand diorama of North India, as if the Hastings are set out to surpass the one hundred and forty four aquitans of the Daniels, Thomas and William Daniels, Oriental scenery. So here are a few of these drawings to give you a feeling for their style. 
everything I'm showing you is in the British Library's collections, and any additional ones which are from the dispersed albums I shall mention at the time. So that this is a drawing which was, was my first, act, my first uh, introduction to see to Rome because it was offered to the offer to the India Office Library back in 1986, I think. And it illustrates the, uh, what was then a very famous canon, the great canon at Agra, sitting on the bank of the River Jumna below the Agra Fort. Here we have the, uh, the, the garden, the well-known garden house of Mir Jafar Khan, the Nawab of Bengal who had a, a garden, a mogul type garden on the river near, on the river Ganga near Patna. This uh, collection of sculptures at a very famous, what was then in the 18th century, early 19th century, a very famous site, Patagata, on, on, the, on the Ganga. And most famous of all, the Taj Mahal. This is from one of the dispersed few, one of the dispersed uh, albums, and uh, it was in the collection of the American collector Paul Walter, but it has subsequently been subsequently been sold. Those of you who know something about Indian painting can readily see the sort of paintings that these are, often called company paintings. They're subjects such as topography or festivals painted by Indian artists for mostly British patrons working for the East India Company who wanted records of contemporary life to take back, take back to, to, to England. These artists use, watercolor, use European techniques such as watercolour rather than the time-consuming traditional pigments of Indian miniatures. So Sita Rao has clearly absorbed considerable influence from the English watercolorists, watercolorists and engravers in Aquitaine, such as William Hodges and Thomas and William Daniel, as well as somewhat later artists in India, such as George Chinnery. Despite the inferences, this artist is able to compose picturesque and beautiful compositions in his own right. Many of them also promised to be of great interest in the discovery of India's past before the advent of photography and the creation of the archaeological survey. Subsequent research on the Hastings private papers, also recently discovered, or discovered in 1995, 1995 revealed that it was Lady Hastings who primarily regarded Sita Ram as her artist, both as a recorder of their travels and also to depict the flora and fauna of India, which was one of her passions. Whether it was she or one of his earlier patrons who arranged for Sita Ram to have lessons in watercolour techniques is not yet known, but that he was expert and even brilliant in this medium is clear from his work. There's considerable evidence that Sita Ram assembled the albums as well and finished off these drawings were already laid down in the, in, in the album format, and all the albums were completed sometime before early 1817. The entire series of 230 paintings thus was therefore accomplished in about 18 months. You must look at these paintings not in the light of Indian aesthetics alone, but through Sita Ram's highly individual eyes, an Indian artist's interpretation of the English picturesque tradition of watercolour painting. So that... Is that working? Yes, there it is. So this is the journey. They started off in Calcutta, started off in Barakpur, the Governor General's country house, went up the river Hooghly to the Bugarat Bagirati, and up past Murshidabad. They joined the main Ganga up, up further, further up at, um, before, before Raj Mahal and then followed it through Benares, Patna, Benares, and so on, right up to Kanpur. There they left the boats and took over, went overland to Lucknow, visited the uh, Nawab of Oud, and then on elephants, horseback, and all sorts of means, went northwest, parallel to the Himalayas, 
as far as Hardra, where the Ganga emerges from the, from the mountains, then southwest into what's now Haryana to Hansi, and then back to the Jamna at Delhi, and then followed the Jamna down past to the uh, Hindu sites of Brindavan and Mathura, Fatipos, and the Mughal sites, Fatipos, Sikri, Sikandra, Agra, and then uh, travelled across country to Fatiga, which was, uh, an, was then an important military station on the Ganga. So this, this they reached, I think, in uh, February 1815, and there they stayed till October, because you couldn't sail down the Ganga during the, during the monsoon. So they, they actually uh, set off in October, 18, sorry, set off from uh, Fatiga in, I think, uh, August 1815, and reached Barrackpore in, in October. <clears throat> so this this is how they travelled in a flotilla up the Ganga, up, up the Hooghly and then the Ganga, flotilla of 222 boats. And uh, the Hastings travelled in the most in, in the two biggest boats. Uh, but they had, they had a troop of the Governor General's bodyguard with them, and I think a regiment of the Bengal cavalry, and then thousands of servants, as 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 one that the way one travelled in those days. So they got to Murshidabad, which was had been the capital of the Nawabs of Bengal. And while still in theory the capital of Bengal, though the Nawab was by this time political, politically uh, non -in, a political non-entity. And this, this is, I think, one of Sitaram's first essays in this style, trying to record the sights as they went along the river and started sketching, sketching the, uh, the buildings, because it's not very like what we know Moshidabad actually looked like. This is a slightly earlier drawing in the British Museum's collection, showing uh, the, 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 uh, the palace and the mosque and various other buildings which we know were in Moshidabad in the early 19th century. And Sitaram hasn't quite gathered his, the elements of his buildings together. But Sitaram, can, he can be accurate when he wants to be, but he's more concerned to be picturesque, I think. He's also often labouring under the disability of sketching rapidly from the river as the boat passed along, and sometimes, as here, he does not seem to put, put the bits together as, accurate, as accurately as he might. <clears throat> so they carried on sailing up the Bhagirati, past the Raj Mahal. No, well, actually, the... the um, when you, when you travelled by boat in early 19th century India, there's only certain times of the year that you could do this because the, the Bhagirati comes out of the Ganga at a place called Suti. And in those days, it was a very shallow entrance into the Bhagirati, which is the westernmost, of the, the westernmost uh, distributary of the river Ganga. And you could only get over that bar at Suti at certain times of year when the river was in full flood. So they'd say they got to uh, Suti in October, September, October 1814, were able to pass into the main river. But then, of course, the monsoon was still raging. Well, not quite raging, but it was still with the dying elements of the monsoon meant the winds were contrary, they were always from the west, the current was fierce. So actually getting upriver against current and wind was something of a trial. Anyway, despite these, oh, here, here's the, um, one of the grandest of Cesar Arms pictures from one of the dispersed volumes. This shows the state, bo the state boats of the Nawab of Murshidabad and they seem to be on the Ganga below Raj Mahal. The water, there's a famous waterfall in the Raj Mahal hills called Moti Janda, the fall of pearls, which is what you can see in, 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 in the, on the falling down the hillside. 
They reached Patna in, on August the 13th, 1814. Here's the main street at Patna. And that's the view from the top of the opium go down at Patna. Bihar and part of UP was used, of course, for the cultivation of opium, which was one of the East India Company's cash crops, which they uh, sent off to China to finance their purchases of teas. And you see it around is um, George himself sketching on the roof of the go down, and there he is. I've, I've isolated the, uh, the little vignette of him sitting there sketching. <coughs> There's the great granary, the great gola at Patna, built by Warren Hastings, ostensibly to prevent further famines in, 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 in uh, Bihar. I put this in to show you what, how they often had to proceed up rivers by the process known as tracking because of the contrary winds and the contrary current. The boatmen were often landed and were, ropes were tied to them on the, on the land and they had to pull the boat up river. And there were 220 of these boats to be hauled up the river in this manner. This is Ghazipur, further up river, the, the palace of the, the Nawab of Ghazipur, who was a, a, a minor nobleman. And this uh, at Ghazipur is the house where Lord Cornwallis, the Governor General, um, who preceded Lord Wellesley, he died in 1798 in this house. I put it in to show you how Sitaram has mastered this new medium of watercolour in the picturesque tradition, a type of compositions he could use it for, differentiating foreground from middle ground for the, and also from the background through the use of repoussoir devices, these darker areas or trees to left and right of the main composition. And of course, he uses, he uses aerial perspective, the gradual diminution, the gradual changes in colour to denote what's in, in what's in the background. So when they were stationary for a while, as they were at this next place, this is Rajgat, on the eastern approaches to Varanasi, with Fertilla reached there on August the 25th. So here, Hastings spent a lot of time on land and, and uh, Sitaram left in the boats and amused himself sketching. He had made a very detailed study of a group of temples at the eastern, uh, the eastern extremity of, of Varanasi, which are actually quite small. So one of the picturesque ideas is to exaggerate the importance and the scale of what it is you're, you're, um, you're actually sketching and to show show where it is in, in spatial terms through the addition of devices such as trees at the side. This is a view of Benares by William Hodges, a similar sort of composition. Hodges, who was in India in the early 1780s. This is from his series known as the um, Selector Views of, in Selector Views of India. And back to Sita Ram, his view of the riverfront at Benares and the, the, the mosque of Aurangzeb of the Badri Rai Ghat. And the palace of the Maharaja of Benares at, uh, at Ramnagar, upstream from the city itself, with on the river his, his state boat. and an unfinished temple, as it was in the early 19th century, built by uh, Chait Singh, Maharaja of Benares, in, I think, the 1770s. <clears throat> and a dramatically foreshortened view of the Ghats at, Bena at Varanasi. So 
Sita Ram is not a slavish copier, but picks selectively from his models. So that, that version of Benares, this version of Benares, is more similar in composition to uh, an aquitaine published by William Hodges of the fort at Allahabad, with a foreshortened view, with repoussoir rocks. Where Sita Ram gives us a fairly straightforward view of the fort, Akbar's fort at, at Allahabad, at the junction of the Ganga and the Yamuna. <coughs> yeah, the, the uh, Yamuna to the left, the Ganga to the right, with some of the boats being hauled round into the river, uh, sorry, into the, from the Yamuna, from the combined river into the actual Ganga itself. And it is a notoriously tricky spot with whirlpools and adverse currents. <coughs> so on the river Ganga between Allahabad and Kanpur, the flotilla passed several small now obscure towns and shrines, which the artist renders with great calm and subtlety. This is the Ghat at Latrigir, where the Nawabs of Aud had a palace, with a brilliant little study of a ferry boat across the Ganga. And this is the Ghat of Tikat, Tikat Rai, who is minister to the Nawabs at Dalmau. And they reached Kanpur on the 8th of October, where there a bridge of boats had been already built across the Ganga, organised for Hastings on the, on the south bank and the Nawab of Aud on the north bank to, to, meet, to meet each other. One of the main purposes of Hastings' journey was to meet the new Nawab vizier of Aud, Ghazi al-Din Haider, who had just succeeded his father, Saadat Ali Khan, in, in 1814. 18, uh, Aoud, Aoud was still theoretically independent of British rule, and the Ganga marked the frontier. And during the, the meetings that took place here in 1814, there was, there was much uh, fating and banquets and exchanges of compliments and exchanges, and exchanges of visits. This was the far as the party went by boat and now travelled overland northeast, but still in comfort. The Nawab had sent 14 of his elephants to convey the principal members of the party to Lucknow. And this is the first view of the Hastings encampment. And he tells us in his journal that there was no fewer than 10,000 people in this camp. And here they are entering Lucknow, with the palace of Shuja Dola on the left and the mosque of Aurangzeb dominating the composition. And here this illustrates an act, what is meant to be an actual moment in the journey, since we understand from Hastings' journal that he and the Nawab were, were sat on the same in the same heart on the same elephant and scattered coins to the people. And that particular view invites comparison with a slightly earlier one by Henry Salt, who'd been, uh, who'd been in, in India in uh, 1802-1803 and published a series of aquatins of his views, this one in 1809. The Hastings party was accommodated in Claude Martin's great house at Constantia, outside Lucknow, to the east of the city. Martin was a French engineer, denied advancement in the company's army, and so took service with Aud. And he had died in 1800, and left his considerable fortune to, to charity to found schools. And Constantia is now the, the school of, famous school of La Martiniere in, in, outside Lucknow. And I see similarly for female education, he left funds for establishment of a women's college, which a women's school, a, female, a girls' school, which is in Calcutta. So 
So looking from the balcony or the, of the terrace of Constantia at the lake, the illuminations reached, well, news, news of Napoleon's first abdication reached Lucknow on the 2nd of November. And Hastings held in honour of the peace the grand dinner, ball and illumination at Constantia. And uh, the Nawab, Nawab was present. And the Nawab had, had another banquet slightly later at his palace, the Fahad Baksh palace, which had actually been Martin's townhouse and was taken over by Sir Atat Ali Khan when he was Nawab from 1801 to be his, his new palace. And in honor of this entertainment, more, uh, there were more illuminations. The whole field had been, converted, had been covered with colored lamps and surrounded by illuminated transparencies, which impressed Hastings deeply. This lightly entry into Lucknow is one of a small number of paintings, which actually illustrates a precise passage in the journal. And I quote, when we rose from the table, we went to a large kind of balcony which commanded the illuminated parterre above mentioned. Fireworks were then exhibited in profusion. And Hastings and Nawab are two of the tiny figures on the, on the balcony of the palace. And just like any tourist, they went to see the sites of Lucknow, including Asaf Adola's great Imambara, built 1784 to 1791, what is the adjacent mosque. And here the interior of the Imambara with a simple grave of Asaf ad who died in 1798. And that's one of Cesar's most successful compositions with the beautiful interior lighting. And they paid uh, paid visits, paid their respects to the temporary tomb of Sa'adat Ali Khan, who had died just the previous year, in, well, no, sorry, the earlier, the same year, in 1814. And Hastings describes it as a wooden structure, gilt and japanned, and surrounded by large fish and buffalo made of glass. <coughs> and it was later replaced by the present stone structures. <coughs> From Lucknow, the party headed northwestwards, crossing at Mahamdi, the border of Aud and British territory, and they continued northwestwards, parallel to the mountains, as far as Maradabad. And Hastings was tremendously impressed by the Himalayas, which were visible for the first time when the, pe when the party reached Maradabad. And he, the, this is the view from the judge's house the roof of the judge's house. And he got seat around to draw the mountains. And I quote from his journal, a Bengal draftsman who accompanied us was directed to make a coloured sketch of the scenery, and he resented as an imposition on his understanding an endeavour to persuade him that the white pinnacles were not clouds. This is the only direct reference to Sitaram in the journal. And then from Maratabad, they continued northwest. This is the view of the mountains from Kashipur, or from near Kashipur. And that's how they're progressing uh, through the Indian countryside on elephants or walking or horseback, as the case may be. And the travelers got as far north as Hardwell, where they spent Christmas. Here the Ganga emerges from the mountains, one of the most sacred sites in India. And there's a rather, rather splendid view of the river and the ghats beyond and the mountains. And the passage on the right, where the river retreats into a haze with a boat, several boats, is very similar to the sort of work George Chinnery and his pupils were doing uh, in Calcutta, tea teaching a whole generation of amateur artists how to paint in watercolour. One of them was Charles Doyley, uh, who was an East India Company civil servant. This is his view of a Gurudwara at Patna, 
and you see the same sort of composition with uh, the river in the foreground and receding in the, in, into the distance. Next to Hadra is Kankal, which is the sort of reception area for pilgrims then and, and, and now. And this is the view of the Choke with its painted houses, which painted with wall paintings illustrating Hindu mythology. From Hadra, they went southwest into Haryana as far as the Sikh, the Sikh state of Jind. Here's a view of Jind from the distance. And then before turning towards Delhi by way of Hansi, the headquarters of the famous regiment of Skinner's Horse, founded by Colonel James Skinner. Between Hansi and Delhi, they met up with the Begum Samru, who had travelled all the way from her estates east of Delhi at Sardala to meet him and stayed with him as far as Mirat. She was one of the most famous characters of the early 19th century India, a former dancing girl who made her way to the possession of a large landed estate and immense riches, and she maintained her own army. <coughs> Hastings felt herself unable to visit Delhi and see the Mughal Emperor Akbar II, since he had no intention of presenting the emperor with the customary nasa, which marked the gift of inferior to superior. He therefore went to inspect the garrison at Mirat, while Lady Hastings went off by herself to Delhi, taking Sitaram with her. And here they are approaching the ancient Kalan Masjid in Delhi, which, uh, which still exists by the uh, Turkoman Gate in the old city. And there's this uh, close-up. It's a fairly small mosque adds height and grandeur to the building. And we can see that Lady Hastings' party and her guards approaching the mosque. Here, yeah, Shah Jahan's great Jami Masjid, dating from the 60s, uh, finished, I think, in the early, late, early 1650s. And this is an impossible view because then houses and streets closely surrounded the entire complex. And you can compare this with the Daniel's view of the Great Gateway from the Aquitaine published in 1796, I think. The tomb of Safta Jung, the Nawab Vizier, who was the, who sort of began the hereditary um, rulership of Aud, but he was often in Delhi as Vizier to the Emperor, and he died there. And the Nawabs kept up the tomb in a way that few other tombs in Delhi were kept up at this time. Lord Hastings joined up with his wife again on the 5th of February, 1815, and united parties marched south to the Hindu Vaishnava centres of Brindaban and Mathura, and the earlier Mughal glories of Agra and Fatipur Sikri. This is the temple of Gobind Dev at Brindaban, built by Raja Man Singh of Amber in 1590, partly destroyed by Aurangzeb. And we have the interior of several of these temples at Brindaban. This is the interior of the Gobind Dave Temple, with very what looks to us like very secular sort of architecture. It was very close to what was going on, what had been built at Fatipur Sikri. And the riverfront at Matra, the bathing guts, but Matra, the birthplace of Krishna and one of the holy cities of Hinduism. And the mid 17th century mosque of Abdul Nabi in the centre of the city, still with most of its encaustic tiles intact. So from Matra, they left the course of the Damna temporarily and diverged to Fatipur Sikri, palace and city built by Akbar in honour of Sheikh Salim Chishti, through whose intercession Akbar believed his son Salim was born in 1569. This is the great mosque. 
and here the beautiful marble tomb built by Akbar for the Sheikh. So the buildings within the palace at Fatpur Sikri to some extent remain mysterious as to their purpose. Here within the Zanada or women's, women's quarters is the interior of an extraordinary cuboid building with its central pillar and aerial walkways. With a, his cedar arm isolates two of the brackets which support the central balcony. And most of the art reviews are, were in volume nine of Sita Ram's, or, or volume nine of Sita Ram's drawings, and that was one that was dispersed in 1974. <laughs> so here, here's the uh, gateway of Akbar's tomb at Sikandra. That's in the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, in Massachusetts. The Taj Mahal, that's, this is what, the one that was in the Paul Walter collection. The Taj Mahal in the morning light. And the Taj Mahal by moonlight. That was in, that still is in the Stuart Carey Welsh collection. And Hastings devotes a considerable number of pages to, to describing Agra and its monuments. And of course, he, he and his wife never tired of visiting the Taj Mahal, and they got Sita Ram to draw it in, at several stages during the course of the day and the e evening to illustrate the, the changing effects of light. And the final volume of Views, volume 10, begins still in Agra with the tomb of Itamut Dola, uh, Nur Jahan's father, 1622, and the interior of the tomb The so-called Chini tomb, that are covered with blue tiles, tomb of Afzal Khan, who died in 1639. And the party left Agra on the 1st of March, 1815, crossing the, the Yamla and marched northeast. On the way, they came to this at Itimadpur, a beautiful late, late Akbar water pavilion. And they were marching towards Fatika, an important military station on the Ganga, where they stayed for the whole of the summer and beginning of the monsoon of 1815. The visits were exchanged with the local Rajas and Nawabs, principally the Nawab of the nearby city of Farukabad. Here's the palace. And here they were in, well, um, in March. They reached Fatigo in March and stayed there until August. And these are illuminations of Fatica to mark the, 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 the birthday of the Prince Regent of the 12th of August, 1815. So during these five months, from March to August, I imagine Sitaram is working up his drawings, adding colours and perhaps laying them down on larger album sheets preparatory for binding them into albums when they got back to Kolkata. Either there or at Fatigo, in any case, before the end of the year, the inscriptions were added below the paintings because they always refer to the Governor-General by his earlier title, Lord Moira, and not as his new title, a Marquess of Hastings, news of which reached Calcutta early in the new year. On the 22nd of August, they embarked on their boats, which had been brought up from Kanpur, where they'd been left the previous year. And there are no drawings illustrating this return voyage as they're in a hurry. Lady Hastings been anxious to return to England with the children as they had become ill during this period. This time, with the wind and currents in their favour, they made a much faster voyage and they reached their journey's end in Calcutta in October, on October the 7th. So... We explored some of the drawings illustrating Lord Hastings' journey, but we've learnt little of anything, if anything, so far of Sita Ram's background, other than that he was a Bengali draftsman. Some of his work on architecture are so detailed, it seems likely he must have been originally trained as an architectural draftsman in one of the architectural or engineering establishments in Calcutta. 
So we've seen some of his best work in this field already with the buildings depicted in their settings, whether urban or landscape, in the picturesque manner. But here are some more where the buildings would have seemed to be depicted for their own sake as architectural details. This is the unfinished monument to Lord Cornwallis at Ghazipur, very typical of Ossie Taram's architectural style with its renditions of individual stones and bricks. A doorway in late Mughal style in its surrounding wall from somewhere in Baranasi. It is not specific in the inscriptions, unfortunately. And likewise, another Hindu temple doorway from Varanasi. And some detail, uh, details of the marble ornaments of the tomb of Sheikh Salim Chishti at Fatipur Sikri. And details of the doorway brackets and chadja, the overhanging parapet of Raja Birbal's house at Fatipur Sikri, from, built in the 1570s. <coughs> So Hastings seems to be referring to this drawing of Raja Birbal's house on fe when he writes on February, February the 18th, 1815. No kind of hangings could have been used in the, in the rooms, for they would have concealed the extraordinary labour and indeed taste with which the stones have been wrought. Many of the patterns and traceries are highly worthy of being adopted in our ornamental architecture. I took measures to have copies from the most striking of these. And this means, presumably means telling his Bengali draftsman, as he calls him, to do this work. Sita Ram was also an extremely talented natural history artist, which I'm afraid we don't have time to go into here. This is one of his most spectacular, the view of a Garaya or Gamgetic crocodile. And the same gift of bringing his subjects to life is found in his rare portraits of humans. Some Sikhs met somewhere near Jind, and the Hastings servants traveling in a, on an elephant. So we, we have Sita Ram is technically extremely proficient, and sometimes he applies this technical brilliance to non-living objects, such as here, a study of two sides of a turban, and a platter of flowers, which they found in a temple or a, or a mosque somewhere in what's now UP. And finally, here he is. I wrote the only known drawing of Sita Ram, which refers to him and is not part of his own work. This is in a private collection. <coughs> you see, it's, it's uh, inscribed on the back, Sita Ram. I have no reason to believe it's not him. He's sitting comfortably in a nice room, probably in the Barakpur house, getting on with his drawings with a view of the river Hoogli beyond. Another two albums of drawings in the Hastings collection illustrate Lord Hastings' subsequent journeys into northern Bengal a few years later. But that is all we know of him. After Hastings' departure in 1822, he disappears from the artistic record. So Sita Ram, I hope will agree from this brief survey of some of his work, is unquestionably a major artist. And his albums are some of the most interesting and beautiful things to have reached us from India's past, certainly from the 19th century. I've not paid much attention to this talk to Hastings in his journal, but if you want more information about the artist and Hastings' thoughts on India and what he said and what he saw on his journey, then may I recommend my book on Sita Ram, it's published in 2015 by both Rowley Books in Delhi and Thames and Hudson in London, and which I believe is on sale in, on a bookstore outside the Treasures Gallery. Thank you. I don't know if this mic is on. Is it? Oh, okay. We've got time for a few questions. Would anyone like to begin? Um, there's a gentleman.
I can see that it's plausible, very plausible, that he was trained as, as, a, um, as an architectural artist. Um, why is there this slightly shaky sense of perspective, a vanishing point and so on, do you think? Could you hear? Sorry, I, I'm awfully deaf. <laughs> Melody's going to act as my interpreter. <laughs> Um, so the question was about his use of perspective, and it's quite shaky. Oh, it's not shaky in Indian terms, it's shaky in Western terms. But no Indian artist, with very few exceptions, ever set out to re replicate, to use linear perspective. You know, because that was a Western construct. And you know, from a Western point of view, if you draw lines of recession, you, you pre reproduce a three-dimensional building on a on a flat piece of paper. But Indians have never seen it that way. It's just a theory, you know. We know that these lines are meant to represent a, a three-dimensional building, but no Indian artist before the 19, uh, sometime in the 19th century subscribed to that theory. So they where was had their own perspective, that, so, but which then where was he multiple trained? viewpoints. Where, where was he trained then in, his, uh, in, in, arch in architectural drawing? I was asking, where was he trained? Oh, that's what we don't know, see. We have no information beyond the works themselves and the occasional reference in Hastings' journal. So, because he was such a brilliant architectural draftsman, I assume he was trained in one of the architectural establishments in Calcutta. You know, where there was lo lots of establishments for engineers and architects who needed to draw, needed to build buildings and bridges and what have you. So why wasn't he then introduced to the idea of perspective in that training? That's what I don't understand. Well, I mean, I can't say I've actually done much work on like, looking for these establishments, but no, no, no Briton in India ever did anything that an Indian could do better. So they had, there might be a, a couple of Indian, a couple of Brits running an institution, but most of the, any, any work of drawings, build, drawing buildings would be done by very Indian draftsmen. And I think also, in addition to that, it's very clear that um, Sita Ramas had training in how to produce watercolours in the picturesque manner. I mean, and he could only have got that from attending sessions organised by artists like George Chinnery, who had lots of pupils and they used to have public, sort of public art sessions in Calcutta at what was called a brush club, I think, a Bengali brush club. And then we have, obviously, nobody refers to Sita Ram being there. I, th I think he must have been. And also, you know, doing, learning how to do, how to, how to produce paintings in this manner. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk and, and, and your book that goes with it is absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask what your views were on the actual production of these scenes. Yeah. So presumably he must have had been part of a flotilla, he must have had a few assistants. Presumably it must have been a series of sketches that were then worked on later when he came home or do you think they were done completely entirely in situ? Well, we have, we obviously, we, don't, we know very little about this because there's been a few references. But um, we know from, say, the journals of William, and William Daniel how he and his uncle, Thomas Daniel, drew schemes on their, way, uh, on their voyages in India by boat and, on, and uh, overland. And they would draw outlines rapidly. And then in, <coughs> and then in the evening, they would... Uh, what do they call it? Uh, wash them. I think they'd wash the drawings. I say adding touches of sepia and so on. And then if they would, they could go take it a further stage and add colour. But that's only very local colour. Because the 1780s they didn't do full coloured watercolours. So I imagine Caesar Ram doing the same sort of thing. He's taking sketches on the boat as he passed interesting buildings, and. At some stage in the evening, in quiet, I hope, and the boats were, boats were, were anchored, he, he would work on the drawings. And then when they had a time, like there were two weeks in Varanasi, and then of course there were four, three, two or three months in Fatica, he would colour them, add the colours, and then there's evidence that they were folded at some stage. Most, many of the drawings have a crease down the middle. 
and that's also caused a bit, there's some damp crept in because some of the skies in particular have the evidence of damp. And back in Calcutta, there are the, uh, the, the, the drawings were mounted on big album sheets and then all bound up because each, each volume has precisely 23 drawings. And each, uh, as a title, uh, a title in leather on the front of each volume saying drawings by Sita Ram, volume one to volume 10, from wherever to wherever. I think we have time for one more question. Are there any clues in um, Hastings' journal as to what the two men made of each other, what their... Sorry, I, I, can't, I can't hear. She wants to know what, if there was any impressions recorded in Hastings' journals on their impressions of each other or their relationship, the relationship between Hastings and Sita Ram? No, well, there's very, very little. There's occasional references to the Bengali draftsman, who is Sita Ram, very, very sing, a singular draftsman. He, he doesn't refer to anybody in the plural, so we assume he's by himself. And, well, you know, <laughs> I say it's... Uh, not a very informative journal in the sense of anything personal coming out of it. Well, thank you very much for a very informative lecture on Sita Ram. I thoroughly enjoy looking at Sita Ram's paintings over time and time again. And well, thank you very much. <laughs>